Our next speaker is Dr. Chana Rock, an extension water quality specialist at the University of Arizona. She is a full professor and specialist in water quality at the U of A Department of Environmental Science. She is a member of the Arizona Water Users Association, American Water Works Association, and a member of multiple state panels addressing water use and food safety concerns. Today, she is going to speak to us about how water quality treatments can affect the microbiology of our soils. All right, well, thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Looks like there's a little over 100 people still hanging on, so I appreciate that. Um, I know it's been a long day, but lots of good information. So I promise to go quickly um, through the content just because I know that, that we're running a bit late, but um, as Robert said, I'm a water quality specialist, so I probably know the least amount uh, about soil health, and so I'm kind of learning as I go. Um, but it's tangential to some of the work that we're recently doing uh, related to agriculture water treatment. So um, as most of you are probably all are aware, uh, recent outbreaks in both Arizona and California over the past couple of years have really shed light on the need for industry to move forward in uh, public health protection. Um, while uh, food safety is paramount to leafy greens growers, there was um, a question and a need and an effort to potentially enhance the way that, that water is used, especially in overhead irrigation scenarios. So um, this time last year, um, in 2019, the Arizona and the California Leafy Green Marketing Agreements came together to look at revisions to the agriculture water metrics. So in these new metrics, they defined um, water. They split it out into two different types. Type A, which is groundwater and municipal water, and type B, which is surface water. Um, the key here is that if you are irrigating overhead um, within 21 days of harvest and you're using type B water, which is surface water, canal water, um, that water now has to have non-detect generic E. coli um, in the majority of samples that are collected. So you can have a single sample maximum of about 10 colony forming units or MPN of, of generic E. coli in, in one sample. Um, but really, we're looking now at, at potable quality water used for overhead irrigation. So this is a huge shift in, in what we've seen um, in previous years. And actually the LGMAs are currently meeting right now um, to go back and to look at this rec uh, recommendation from last year to see if they can tweak it to make it even a little bit better um, and improve based on grower feedback. So the big thing related to agriculture water treatment is that it's recommended that you have to use a US EPA approved sanitizer in accordance with that label, um, the specifications, the guidelines for this use, and then um, especially considerations for environmental impacts. Um, a huge issue, however, is related to the fact that most, if not all, uh, US EPA approved sanitizers are not specifically labeled for, for the die off or disinfection or sanitation of human pathogens. And so now we have this, this little conundrum where we're suggesting industry to treat water to reduce human pathogens, but what we might not have labels to do so. so Generally, what we might see for labels is the reduction of algae or the reduction of biofilm or modification of pH or different things like that. So um, what we're seeing now is a shift in a lot of these um, sanitizers and chemical suppliers to seek out modifications of their EPA label and looking at FDA and EPA to help them do that, um, to look at a, a, a more streamlined and and, and clearer path to be able to get a revised label. So thinking about water treatment, it's complex and I won't read all of these different boxes, I'll let you guys do that, but it's not just pick a chemistry and go. You know, for those of you that are either growers or those of you who work with growers or PCAs, um, you know, it's, it's very challenging to identify, you know, what methodology or treatment is going to be right for you um, and right for your crop and right your, for your location and to do that successfully. So um, what we're seeing is a lot of questions from industry about how to do this effectively. 
So here's some examples of the most commonly used water treatment chemicals or devices. Um, EPA divides these into two different categories, uh, a physical pesticide application device or a, an actual chemical itself. The ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that are most commonly used. Um, I would say that uh, on the chemical side, uh, proxy acetic acid, sodium or calcium hypochlorite or, or chlorine or bleach, um, and then chlorine gas are probably the ones that you're going to see most often. Probably the number one is going to be um, one of those chlorine derivatives. What we're also seeing, however, is this push to have um, an alternative or a non-chemical component to be used uh, because of some questions about soil health. Um, and so one of these that we are seeing a push for recently is UV light. But as you can imagine, if you're going to use UV, in the field or on the open environment, and it's going to be challenging, right? So you're going to have to have a lot of energy. You're going to have to have a very skilled workforce to be able to do that. And then the equipment itself is, is super expensive. But if it works and, and we can balance that out with um, environmental health and soil health, maybe, maybe that's a workable solution for industry. So I know that um, Robert's going to share these slides, so I'll go ahead and, and show this one really quickly. And if you want to jot down that, um, that website, you can, or you can see this later. The Produce Safety Alliance, um, which was mentioned a little bit earlier um, by Michelle J. Russell and then also, also Dave Ingram, talks a bit about uh, water requirements under the Produce Safety Rule um, for FSMA, um, but also they've put together a really fantastic um, spreadsheet that, that has all the different trade names for the chemistries, the registration number, the label, so you can pay a little bit more attention. You can go in and, and, and call out the information that you need uh, to be able to make your decisions. So again, a little bit about the EPA regulation of some of these chemicals. Um, you've got to follow the instructions on the label. Um, some states are going to be different. So California is certainly different than Arizona with the registration and those environmental requirements. And as I said earlier, there's no EPA approved chemical treatments uh, for ag water specifically for reducing human enteric pathogens. However, a good thing is that scientific studies may exist and, and certainly work that we're doing at the University of Arizona and others across the nation are doing to better understand set limits for control of these foodborne pathogens and indicators. Um, so it's exciting that we're, we're seeing a big push to better understand water treatment chemistry on the microbial side. Um, and what I'm going to talk about kind of moving forward is some of the, the questions that we still might have. I think one of the big things that are misconceptions that we see with industry is, is simply about how chemical disinfection works. So we know that uh, disinfectants and sanitizers don't kill instantaneously on contact. And, and that rate of inactivation depends on a lot of different things going on. So obviously, who you're trying to kill. Is that E. coli 157H7? Is that cyclospora? Is that another pathogen? So, so that's kind of the first thing. Um, the next thing is the chemical concentration. So what's the dose? So how much of that chemical do you need? The third is the contact time. So the contact time is the amount of time that that bacteria, that virus comes into contact with that chemical and allows that breakdown of the cell wall, uh, if that's the, the mechanism of action. The fourth is the temperature of the water. And unfortunately, out in ag irrigation environments, that's not necessarily something that we can modify, um, but perhaps you can modify the time of day in which you're treating your water or irrigating uh, to best fit the chemistry. Um, not super doable, but, but an option we've heard. And then last is the pH of the water. So we have seen um, some folks that have done a relatively good job of being able to manage pH, um, uh, have acidification occur on site. Um, but again, that can be challenging and then also costly if we're thinking about um, the amount of acid that you might have to use. So again, there's those factors. Again, um, one that I didn't bring up previously, again, that's a huge concern is organic matter. So the, or, the issue with any kind of organic matter and an oxidant is that that organic matter is going to consume a lot of that disinfectant. And if it's going to consume that disinfectant, then that disinfectant's not going to be able to work very well. So things that people have done, solutions, um, are maybe adding in another treatment step that's either going to 
flock or, or bind up some of that organic matter and get that to fall out or filtration. So again, thinking about what is actually doable in an agriculture environment, um, adding in one more uh, pretreatment step uh, may be super challenging. Another component to agriculture water treatment is the monitoring component. So we work pretty closely with industry to develop and assess monitoring plans. So monitoring plan, just like anything else, is a plan of sequence observations or measurements that tells you if you're being successful or not, or sets you up um, to, to know if you're being successful. Um, they're also helpful to track your progress, identify trends, um, and then have some written documentation that you can use to be able to meet um, the new LGMA requirements. So what are some types of monitoring? Um, these are two types. So the one on the right is, is more of like a, a titration kit where you might have a, a collection reservoir and a series of chemicals that you, you drop in to tell you the concentration. The one on the left is more common. It's like the dipstick type um, that you see um, that you're visually comparing a color change um, to a scale. So one of the things we do work on uh, with growers are setting uh, things that we call critical limits versus operational limits. So a critical limit is the limit um, at which that parameter must be controlled to prevent or eliminate or reduce um, whatever you're trying to reduce. So in this case, um, generic E. coli, uh, for example. It's got to be easily measured and it's got to be something that we're, we hold pretty tight to um, with respect to monitoring. Alternatively, an operational limit is something that might be a little bit higher that's going to trigger you to be able to make a decision. So again, we've been working with irrigators, PCAs, and growers to better assess and define what their critical limits are and then what their operational limits are. So here's a, a pretty good um, graph that dictates the difference between an operational limit and a critical limit. We have time along the bottom. We have free chlorine residual on the left-hand side. Um, we've set the operational limit at five and then that critical limit at two, and this is parts per million. So as you can see, that blue line is that measure of free chlorine and the history of that. And as you see that line dip below the operational limit, you're going to trigger to make a change. Um, you're going to go to your pump and check that it's working appropriately. You're going to go to your reservoir tank and you're going to check that that chemical is feeding into the system appropriately. Um, unfortunately, if, if you dip below your, your critical limit, that's going to trigger you to have some sort of corrective action. And so in most cases, the corrective action for water treatments, um, uh, dipping below where it's supposed to or, or below your critical limit, would mean raw, harv uh, raw product pre-harvest testing for pathogens. So, you know, what are some of these questions we still get about water treatment and, and how does this relate to soil health? I recognize I've been talking a lot about water, but certainly we get questions about the systems themselves. How do you set them up? How do you troubleshoot them? How do you re-verify them? You know, where are we gonna monitor for? Um, but really kind of these last three questions are ones um, that we're trying to answer with some of our work and then some colleagues work as well. Um, one of the things that happens when you pull together an oxidizer and organic matter is the formation of, of something called disinfection byproducts. So we're really familiar with, with DBPs or disinfection byproducts when we think about drinking water. They're hazardous to human health. They're a really big issue in, in some sections of the country and specifically related to the use of chlorine in waters that have high organic matter and high organic load. Um, so the concern there would be that if you form DBPs, um, they potentially then could be starting to concentrate in those leafy greens or concentrate in soils and lead to negative health outcomes. And so we want to get ahead of that and, and think about that a bit. Um, the next is the impact of treatment on soil health and the microbiome. Um, Stephanie and others did a really great job of kind of talking about some of the uh, different organisms that can be in the microbiome, so the beneficials and also the ones that can be considered um, pests, um, and those can be human health pests or, or plant pests. So we have to think about the impact of treatments um, on these, these really productive lands and these communities that we've worked so hard to build up 
And if we're spraying a, a, a sanitizer on that, are we just knocking them all down? Are we defeating kind of the initial purpose of building up these complex um, microbiomes and, and organisms? And then last, and, and one that we're really dealing with right now, are compatibility issues with fertigation and pesticide application and chemistry. So, um, you know, they're both usually applied during an overhead irrigation or a furrow irrigation, you know, being either dripped into the canal or, or directly pumped into the, uh, the distribution system. And what is going to happen um, with those crop products and um, that chemical? Um, and so I know Palumbo has done some really great work initially to look at the impact of the chemistry on the crop product itself and, and availability and uptake. Um, my concern is the flip to that. So if you have these crop products um, in conjunction with an oxidizer, is that going to then prevent um, the oxidizer from working on the bacteria, from killing that bacteria? So we've got two kind of questions and, and really thinking about some of these unintended consequences uh, that might occur. So as I said, DVPs are an issue um, specifically with organic matter and, and chlorine and the formation of them. Um, one thing that I hadn't mentioned um, yet is related to disinfectant demand as well in interference with things like UV. So not just chlorine, but other types of, of treatment as well. So with that in mind, uh, the last uh, few slides that I'll share, uh, we'll go over, over quickly a research project that we were recently funded um, by the Center for Produce Safety. Fortunately, we were able to get some of it off the ground um, right before COVID hit, but right now we're kind of in a pause mode. Um, so it's a good opportunity to kind of talk about that. But um, some of the things that we're doing is, is dose optimization. So what are the lowest doses of these different chemicals that we can use? Um, to be able to still uh, see effective um, die-off or degradation of these um, organisms of interest. So generic E. coli, total coliform bacteria, and then we're also looking for E. coli 157H7 and salmonella, salmonella. So we're doing laboratory bench stop, or bench top experiments to better understand, you know, where is that happy, uh, happy medium, that happy space for, the, for these doses. The second is taking all this back out into the field and doing some field scale water treatments. Um, while in the past folks have been really good about doing laboratory and, and bench scale, you know, you take everything out to the field at scale and, and things look a little bit different. And so we've been super fortunate to have industry partners that have um, been able to put in pretty large plots for us to be able to have us evaluate. Um, we collect samples of irrigation water pre and post treatments. Um, at sprinkler heads of the birds and we evaluate the water quality and we look at die off over time. Um, one of the things that's really nice about what we do is that we can um, obviously sample more often than a grower would. So we can, we can um, divide up our sampling in really, really short increments so we can see what's happening to water quality over time um, and really try to hone in on when do we have the conditions um, exactly right. So generally a water treatment setup, you have a maize based system where you have a feed tank where you have the chemical or the sanitizer of interest and that's being pulled in um, from the, the high pressure side of a pump um, and then uh, mixed within the pump and then, and then pushed back out through the distribution system. That's generally the way that we um, set up most of our agriculture water treatments. As I mentioned before, we talk a ton about monitoring and how to support industry with monitoring. Um, we look at the really cheap and inexpensive monitoring all the way up to the really expensive kind of electrodes. So there's a variety of different and um, I'll say that, you know, all work relatively well. It's just at what sensitivity um, do you want to be able to measure um, whatever chemical that you're looking at. And again, here's just two examples. Um, the hot chlorine colorimeter on the left and then a, a more um, accurate kind of test reader strip on the right. We are also monitoring for DVPs. Um, our, we've got some USDA partners that are going to be looking at that for us. Um, and that's really going to be exciting uh, because really this is some of the first DVP work that we've seen, um, specifically looking at leafy greens um, and agriculture water treatments. 
And then the fourth objective, um, we're partnering with uh, Dr. Carrie Cooper down at the University of Arizona, really trying to better understand these microbial communities. Um, we've got questions about short, medium, and long-term impacts of ag water treatment on productive lands. Um, and again, just as a reminder, the microbiome is that community of, of microorganisms. Um, I know some folks already have kind of gone over the difference between rhizosphere and phylosphere. So just as your, um, just a reminder, the rhizosphere is the zone of soil uh, surrounding a plant root, and then the phylosphere is in the plants. Certainly you can have both beneficial and harmful organisms that make up uh, that microbiome. And we're interested in all of those, uh, but more, um, we're interested in changes over time. So um, because of the way that the LGMA is written, um, 21 days is kind of that sweet spot where growers will start to implement agriculture water treatments. So we're collecting samples uh, prior to treatments and then post treatments um, at these kind of time points that are dictated below. So we're taking thousands of samples, we're taking them at you know, soil surface uh, and then and kind of deeper um, within the soil profile, really to better understand um, how we see these shifts over time. So here's uh, some of our folks out collecting plant tissue, root zone, and then soil core samples. Um, this is the Yuma Agricultural Test Site location. Um, and this was work that, again, we did at the beginning of the year. So what is some of the research to date? I know I didn't have a ton of research to date, and I know we're still getting off the ground, but we've been able to conduct field trials of PAA, chlorine dioxide, and calcium hypo um, in two locations in both in Maricopa and Yuma. Um, we are also, as I said, collecting water samples for those indicators and those physical and chemical parameters, as well as the DBPs. Um, and then we are taking samples for the phylosphere and the rhizosphere. So again, some of that initial data, not super surprising things that we've seen already, is that systems are highly dynamic and it takes a while for stabilization of that chemistry to kind of make it through the distribution system. And that's certainly dependent upon a lot of factors, um, but it's not as traditional as we thought, um, just pressurization equals stabilization. And so they're certainly more dynamic and more challenging than we thought. Obviously, the other thing that sanitizer and disinfectant doesn't kill things instantaneously. And so when we look at microbes breaking through um, the sanitizers after they've been stabilized, you know, we kind of see things go up and they come down and they go up and they come down. Um, and that could be related to source water. It could be related to the pump. It could be related to the distribution system. So how do we provide guidance to industry so that they can narrow um, that a bit and be able to better hone in on that sweet spot uh, for water treatment. So what's next? Where are we moving to? Um, obviously, we're setting up benchtop experiments. We're kind of waiting with bated breath on re-entry approval from the University of Arizona. Um, we are coordinating treatment locations in Texas as well. So this project is, is really focused on the Southwest and, and continue to sample um, for those microbiome shifts over time. And so um, I joked, I gave a, a portion of this presentation to a group of food safety folks. And I said, we all need t-shirts that say, you know, water treatment is risk reduction, not hazard elimination. So I think it's really important to think about, you know, water treatment as a risk reduction practice, but you're not gonna get rid of every microbe that's, that's in that system, that's just not feasible. Um, and so what are ways that we can, and do this and do this optimally, um, but also thinking about kind of these short, medium and long-term impacts as well. So just two more slides, um, certainly like to acknowledge a number of partners, certainly the Center for Produce Safety, but a number of industry partners who either donated land or cash match to the project or um, water treatments or sample analysis. 